our Oilers oh. mini podcast quick hits thing. Uh, I'm Nolan, Professor Scribbles. I don't know where it is on Adams. I'm guessing that's Adam, aka Sweet, and either there or there will be James, aka Paul McCartney. Um, first things first, let's talk about the game we just got done watching. Uh, Adam, tell us what you think. Um, you were very excited do we, prior to the start of this we, to discuss do it. To, do we have to watch it? I don't. <laughs> uh, it was just, it was bad. I don't know what else you can say about the whole game was terrible. Maybe Clem, uh, Kem Tell wasn't too bad. He made uh, three of the goals were, you know, not great. Uh, two of them were absolutely not his fault. Third one was a terrible giveaway. Um, one he probably could have had, and that's about it. And then McDavid was fairly silent up until maybe the last play where he tried to make a move, and then he created a couple scoring chances in first. Um, you all, you, Hall and Drysdale shut down. Scrivens was amazing. It was just... I don't, I don't want to curse too much today, so I'm not going to say anything about Schultz, but um, take him off the goddamn power play for fuck's sake! Take him off the power play. Yeah, he, Rune's not here, so we can talk mad shit about Schultz now. Oh my god, just, 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 <laughs> it's just, yeah. I'm just so done with him. I don't. Yeah, know. that was the first game in a while where Schultz was noticeably bad to me. Like. I've given him the benefit of the doubt a lot of the times this season, and I've given him a long leash because he looked so good before he got hurt. But he was awful today. I think um, awful is lightly. He, yeah, he was brutal today. Nurse was was pretty bad. Um, Nurse has been pretty bad for a while now, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but that's growing pains. Hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed. So I don't know. I don't know. It was a brutal game all around, and just the fact that it had to happen in Montreal against that team and those fans just <sighs> kills me. Oh, fuck yeah. Of all the no, teams um, lose to. I don't really know if it's fair to blame Talbot for any of that. I mean, they didn't get any like low percent scoring chances that you'd expect Talbot to get, or at least I didn't notice any because I stopped watching in the third period. That was mm-hmm. just a fucking clusterfuck, but Schultz... Bad play after bad play, not like, you know, maybe earlier in the season pre-injury where he'd do one stupid thing per game, but he'd really nailed it to just doing one bad thing. He was catastrophic the entire do you, game. Do you want to know his core Z percent for that game? Oh, please. <laughs> oh, I have to pull it back up. Oh, no. It it's was... in the 30s, isn't it? Oh, it's... Oh, yeah, you bet it is. It's, uh... I lost my phone here, but it is Justin Schultz had a core Z 4 percent of 31.82 percent today. Playing third line minutes, fifty uh, percent zone starts. Thirty thirty one point eight two percent. That's bad. That's bad. That's worse that's than worse Corp- than That's like that's like that's, me that's, <laughs> getting airdropped into an NHL game. That's that's bad. I mean, well, the whole it's, team. It's fine because he's a power play specialist and he has that rifle of a shot, so it's all right. justified. Someone has it's a lighter. Uh, Latestu at twenty two percent. Yeah, just a bad I'm game. Latestu's line was probably getting a little bit. He worse. had forty. He had forty percent zone up. starts. Um, Zach Cassian also had twenty three percent. Yeah, I was gonna say he doesn't have the best line mates to be the third line center there, but I mean you'd expect that line to produce a little bit, and we were just god awful everywhere. And of course, yeah. fucking former Oilers goalie and my namesake on Reddit, Ben Scrivens, fucking yes. shuts shit down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Kovalev also had a twenty-eight. So yeah, it was like Mc, oh, McDavid was functionally the only person trying that game. I mean, you know, Hall was trying, but Hall turned into Taylor well, Fall, and and Eberle was actually not a half bad. I'll admit, of all the players, Eberle was probably created well, the Hall most. Hall was trying; it just wasn't very effective, and McDavid was fucking pulling his heart out there. But it grab it, everyone taken, was pretty uh, dismal. But onto onto greener pastures. <sighs> what about the two games before this one? But when we were boarding the hype train again, yeah. Specifically, Columbus, let's let's start with Columbus. Columbus, who was the other one against? I can't even remember. Ottawa. 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 Right. Okay, so Columbus. I mean, that was the perfect game for McDavid to come back. Uh, Columbus is is atrocious. I think they they have the worst goal differential in the league. I'm pretty sure they allow the most goals per game. Um, their number one D man is like Jack Johnson, I guess. So. Yeah, for us at best, I don't know. Yeah, they have, Seth, they have Seth Jones now. Remember, they don't have Jack Jones. They have Seth, well, they have Jack Jones. Seth Jones on their team now. Well, that's true. I guess I don't know. It was a good game to come back because Columbus sucks. Yeah. So. 
I was I was cool with it. It was. They had a great... Oh yep, yeah, sorry. They they dominated too. Oh yeah, they. That, I mean, the fucking goal. Oh yeah, the goal. Yeah, you gotta touch on that too. That's true. I mean, do we have to? We've already seen it like fifty yeah, times. There, there's nothing more to talk about. It's just you have to say it again. The fucking goal. Yeah, it's the just goal. The goal, goal of the year for the others. Like no contest. I think it was you, Adam, that was saying this, but people are getting all over McDavid about it and trying to downplay it because the def- the defensemen like tripped over themselves or caught a caught yeah, an ice pick or whatever. And it's like that's what McDavid does to you. Yeah, no, yeah. it's. It's called an ankle breaker, and there was there were people trying to downplay it, saying, "Oh yeah, well the defenseman tripped over himself because there was, you know, and, and it wasn't actually gonna, that, that nice of a goal." It's like, come on, no, just just like fucking no. just admit it. Korpakovsky could try to do the same thing, but it wouldn't work because he's not skilled enough. McDavid is so fucking fast and so good that he started off going into three guys with like a good ten feet of them recognizing this, and they just couldn't stop him. It didn't matter what they did. Now McClellan mentioned that um, it might be for McDavid. It might be. It was a good test because that was a similar in- similar situation to how we got injured, uh, you know, eighty nine or ninety one days before that. Do you guys think that was you know it's, he's right on that or is you know ninety one fucking days? Jesus Christ! <laughs> is is it is that kind of par for the course there that he was you know it was a similar situation he went straight forward is a good sign. Yeah, I think, I think, so. think so. I mean, it's not something that I actually thought about beforehand. Just. He's he's just playing his game. I mean, I don't want to read into it too much, and I hate reading these articles about like Don Cherry fearing for his long term health and everything. It's like, just let him play. Stop putting him under the microscope with everything. You know, he's gonna be fine. Just stop making at it. I guess. Yeah, McDavid is a model professional. I I don't think there's much worth looking into here. He's just going to go right back into the game and start playing the way he plays. And obviously he's not having any problem with that. Although as the last game showed, he's going to need a little bit of help if he's going to try doing that every single game, night in, night out. Now, speaking of uh, McDavid and the line he's been playing on, um, now obviously moving on to Ottawa, they were very, very, the whole team was amazing in that game. Um, Yakupov was the only forward without a point. And speaking of Yakupov, obviously he's been relegated to the third line with Cassian and Latestu. Do you see him on the way out this summer? Or the trailer line? Oh, yeah, I could see that. I, He's, yeah. I just, I mean, Eberle looks so good with, with McDavid, too. It's it's no longer, I think, that Cognac is such a great chemistry pairing anymore. I mean, I think Eberle kind of needed that jump start, and he's gotten it. But even when Yakupov was with him, he hasn't looked spectacular. We're not, I think, at this point, trading Moy drops from high risk to medium. Because we have kind of an idea... That he might be just a straight up bust at this point, so but I you, fucking love the kid. Yeah, but like, do you keep? Do you say kid? He's like three years older than me, but I digress. Because Nail is is obviously a, um, he's on a low value contract, but he's also his his value is low right now. So do you trade him and get lower return, or do you trade Everly or Nugent Hopkins to get high value? If the chemistry is there with Everly and McDavid, I mean that saves Everly's place on the team. I think that if they work well together, then then you keep them. Yakupov goes. Um, Nuge stays, because I still think he's the only center that you can put on in any situation and be confident that you're going to get a good performance or a decent performance anyway. Um, but yeah, as far as Yakupov goes, he... Yeah, Nolan said it. Like I think maybe it's becoming just apparent that he's just a straight bust. And I do like him. I like him on social media, and I love his attitude. And I know that he loves the Oilers, but uh, he needs to be better, a lot better. And another thing, I guess, just to continue on that point, like Yakupov is getting pretty close to just straight up being able to be called a bust. But that entire draft year now is looking pretty fucking weak because we were talking about Columbus's best defenseman. No one thought to mention Ryan Murray. No. Where's he been? It's been four years since he was drafted, too. And, yeah, he's had some injury problems, but, you know, everyone might have to deal with them. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And he's not relevant. Um, I mean, I I guess you could say Alex Galchenyuk, but even Alex Galchenyuk hasn't been that good. He's been been pretty good, but I think his numbers are fairly close to Yakupov's. Yakupov's. The difference is that Montreal is doing well. And Galchenyuk's doing okay, whereas the Oilers have been shit, and Yakupov's been doing a little bit worse than okay. So everyone shits on Yakupov, 
but Montreal Circle Jerks about every player on their team not named Jared Tenorti and Alexi Emelin. Okay. I think James is making a good point, though. James, you were saying that he bur- they bury him? Yeah, they, they buried Galchenyuk. Like, he's a centerman. He plays on the wing. Um, he he doesn't have good line mates, so I think Galchenyuk is actually better than his numbers. Um, if I could redo the 2012 draft, I would certainly take Galchenyuk instead of Yakupov. Yep. But... I mean, yeah, the, the draft just in general, like it doesn't. I'm looking at the, the page on uh, Hockey DB right now, and it's like Hampus Lindholm, he's pretty good. Um, Jacob Truba, taking a big step back this year. Philip Forsberg, he's great. He's, but, he's not like, like, this year either. There's a lot of names here. I mean, the thing is, too, they're only, what, 22. So it's like. Yeah, well, that's the thing with with Ryan Murray and Truba is that they're still very young and they could get very good because they're still maturing. <coughs> Whereas the forwards, you've kind of hit the point where it's like they need to start showing more promise. The thing with Yakov yeah. is you could also argue that he's been buried too. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, you could I argue. wouldn't call Latestu and Cassie an effective playmaking line mates. <laughs> then again, I feel like a number one overall pick needs to anchor a line instead of being a passenger and i feel like yakupov is a passenger on whatever line that he's on you know that actually brings that brings me back to a thought that i had a little while ago um when right when smitty was still on the team hall was playing on a line on the third line with him for like 10 or so games and he made that line look really good whereas now yakupov is on a line with cassian and Latestu. not for very many games obviously like just a couple we've only had Cass for a few but he's yeah. still invisible on the ice i didn't notice him in today's game i just didn't know he was playing <laughs> I, I noticed him a bit and that was because he was getting ice time at the end and he was one of the few guys that was still still had some jump in his step which i do love from these like i said like james said his attitude is great but uh, I, i'll probably buy a Akbov jersey because i do love the kid but i don't know if he's gonna be on the team past the deadline this year or past the summer he'll he might you know what do you guys trade him for maybe a second or third round pick kind of thing if, if that oh last thing we fucking need is more draft picks. I think we need to get some kind of player out of that, but like, what can we get for Yakupov? That's the issue, right? Another depth forward? Another number five or six defenseman? Like, we're in a place where he's not, he's not worth a lot. We don't want to trade him. We don't want what we'll get for him at all. So in that, in that argument then, with, with as far as return goes, is it not better to trade a a player who you're going to get massive value for than a player who you're not going to get anything for? The thing is, like, Eberle is worth a hell of a lot more, and especially since, you know, he's kind of gotten another second, well, his second win with McDavid, honestly. Um, well, even before We're going to have to trade, we're going to have to trade at least one of the guys making six million eventually to make room for Dreisaitl Nurse and yeah. potentially Davidson and definitely and Mc- fucking McDavid. McDavid. Yeah. Um, so someone's going to have to go, but I feel like if we trade away <laughs> Eberle and keep Yak, we still have one winger who's not producing at all, doesn't have a history of producing well beyond his single year in the rookie season, which was really a 20-25 game stint of greatness, D- I guess you could call it, for him. D- and, White and then, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. And then with we don't really have a top right wing after that. I mean, Teddy Purcell, and then it actually drops down to Cassian and Yakupov. That's kind of throwing away like <coughs> of our top scorers, and we're going to be in a tough spot next season. Mm-hmm. D. White Although, again, Utah maybe Utah Eberle States. for a guy like Shattenkirk makes our defense good enough that Talbot and the defense can carry us with Hall and Dry and McDavid, but yeah. I don't know. Sorry, James. In the YouTube chat there, D. White says, Is Yak so bad? He's a shooter, but when's the last time we were able to set him up for his one-timer magic shot? Um, I mean, that's not you're not wrong, but at the same time... Like they were saying, I think at some point you have to kind of take responsibility of your line, and he does. He Yakupov's not a puck mover, and that's the issue. Is that for what for what we have available for him, we can't play him on a line where he'll be useful because then it indicates the ability of another player to do good too. So when you have a chemistry like uh, Dry Settle and Purcell and and Hall and oh. the second line right now with Pouliot, McDavid, and and Everly, you have no really else where he can play or nobody else to play with him. The only way you can get around that is maybe picking up a, you know, another uh, left winger that's uh, not Pouliot, but at the same time, Pouliot's good. Like, or not Pouliot, sorry, not uh, Cassian. The other yeah. side of this, though, do you guys wait until McDavid comes back? 
and maybe trade Yakubo over the summer if they can't figure out something while well, Mel well, well, or sorry about well, uh, Nugent Hopkins comes back. Sorry, say that question yeah, again. You kind of lost me there. Sorry. Um, do you guys wait for Nugent Hopkins to come back before you trade Yakubo because you don't know if maybe that he's going to be useful in the third line with him or second line? I mean, if it's going to take another first overall pick to make a first overall pick good, then I don't really know. It's it's kind of a we're in a really weird position. But then but... who do you play on the third line then? Because then you run into the issue of having Nugent Hopkins or McDavid on the third line with nobody else to play with. Because you're either sticking yeah. with Iropakarinen or Hendricks. Cassian. Okay, well, that's one wing. I still hold out hope for Cassian to be like an impact offensive player because I still remember him in juniors when he was with the Windsor Spitfires and he was like the Eric Lindros of that league, man. <laughs> Obviously, it's not really going to pan out, but uh, I don't know. Actually, you know what? About the about Yakupov having that magic shot, what part of his shot is magic? Just how hard he shoots it or how often it goes in? Because Yakupov, since his rookie Terrible season, accuracy. has had a... He's had a shooting percentage below 10%. It's gotten worse every year since his rookie season, which was a staggering 21, you know, not sustainable at all. And another player that we have in our minors that shoots a really hard slap shot, Brad Hunt. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. And that's all That's all he's really good for, frankly. But if we're quantifying Yakupov based just on the fact that he has a hard, good shot, then fuck it, convert Hunt to forward and trade Yakupov, right? Some, <laughs> Yakupov some needs to provide loser, a little bit more after four years, I think. Some loser called a runatic five. Yak is literally playing the shitty minutes and the main thing making that third line decent. <sighs> okay, but where else are you going to put him? Yeah. Like, at this point, like, I mean, either you hold on to him until... Uh, also, thanks for joining us in, in the comments, but not on the podcast. Appreciate that. Um, thanks 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 arun um the quality of my webcam went down a couple minutes ago that's yeah anyway so um the issue you run into is that either you wait until Nugent hopkins comes back and then maybe trim over the summer which i wouldn't be opposed to if if something works out where you have three centers but then i know arun you had said you don't want to trade Nugent hopkins nolan what do you think about trading nuge not this season not yet so then you hold on to nuge and everly over the summer uh, I think there's not a rush to trade any of the three guys making six mil this season because Nuch could just go to the wing if, for whatever reason, things are working really well with um, McDavid and Dry as the two centers. So then how do you solve the D problem? Because the issue you run into then is you have to give up to get something and our defense needs to improve. We have Sekra and Clefbaum. We have Davidson and Schultz and then Fain and Griba and Nurse. And Nurse isn't ready to play, as we've seen lately, isn't ready to play top six minutes yet. He needs to play third pairing uh, or in the AHL. And yeah. Griba is probably going to get sold at the deadline. Uh, Clefbaum's still out, although supposedly during during the game they said he'll be back in hopefully in 10 days, but we don't know what's going to happen with that. So who do you give up then to get a piece? Because, I mean, Jolts is gone, thank God. But we don't know. They, you know, you got to give something up. A runatic five. What, what team, shooting what, what percentage team would give is up? not a good metric to use when taking when talking about snipers. Snipers are supposed to shoot a lot. Snipers are supposed to score a lot. <laughs> like you can't even I call mean, like, Yakupov. Yeah, a I would. I'd give. Like I really like Neil Yakupov, but I'm trying to look at this as objectively as possible. Yeah. His scoring numbers fucking suck for a first overall pick, and I know it's unfair to perhaps. Uh, poison the well by judging him specifically as a first over pick and not just as a player with potential but his scoring rates have also i'm pretty sure gone down every single year even even as a player it's, he's not potential. being helped i'm sure he wasn't being helped by the changing coaching system i sure i'm sure whatever eakins was doing in the second year was fucking over everybody but like i i mean like, I... look at every other first overall pick well how's nate mckinnon doing right like we just we drafted in a really shitty year for first overall and yeah. yakpov's just not producing it's okay to accept that a player might be a bust but yakpov like he he shows that he's got the work rate and he really wants to be good but none of his seasons at all have matched the scoring pace of nate mckinnon in his worst season, which they're is all, this one. They're also different players, though. I mean, Nate McKinnon is has a much Sorry, last season, level. his... Yeah. 
that, that's the thing, is that we're comparing Nelly Yakupov, who has tools to succeed, but not necessarily... He doesn't have as good hands. He doesn't have as good hockey IQ. And that's a big issue with Yakupov, I find, is that his hockey IQ isn't as high as it could be. He's a great... Yeah. He's, he has the potential to be great, and I love the kid, but... I think at some point you do have to accept the fact that maybe he's not he's not going to be like you can't tag the because once you once you've been drafted where you've been drafted doesn't matter it's what you do so realistically you can say a former first round pick that's that's fine but yeah if you've done what have you done for me lately is, is I'm not I'm not trying right. to say that oh well you know they're both first overall picks therefore the holy grail of this is that he's not as good as Nate McKinnon therefore trade him but he's the most direct comparable besides I suppose Alex Galchenyuk. And I'll I, look him. Up I right think Galchenyuk's probably the closest comparison. Last time I checked, they had a close to the same PPG. Like it was off by like point point oh two. Um, their goals per game was pretty much the same. They get approximately the same amount of ice time. Uh, they're they're similar players. Although yeah, although Galchenyuk's more of an agitator. Yeah, Galchenyuk's got uh, like a couple chips more points than Yakpov. Yeah. They're they're fairly comparable. Yeah. Um, I don't know at this point, but for me, I think you do have to give it until McDavid or until Nugent Hopkins come back to see if they're going to pair Nuge with Pulleyot and Everly again and bring McDavid down and see what they can do together. But at that point, is it is it McDavid succeeding with anybody that you pair him with, or is it Yakupov, you know, playing well with McDavid again? And that's again the issue. Um, what do you do with Everly now? Yeah, see now the other issue there we're running into is. Um, there's Hamannick available this summer. I think there's talks about uh, Brodeen being available, um, although not necessarily with with Edmonton, but more with New York and then trading Hamannick here or something along those lines. Uh, Bufflin potentially being available, although uh, I wouldn't really necessarily want him. So if in order to get one of those guys, do you not have to give up something good? You absolutely do. Yeah, yeah, so you then, do. But I mean, so then is, is, is that really what we need? Is more young D? Well, but who I else think, are you gonna go with? They overrated. Uh, well, I, mean, I want Tyson. Not that young, so that would be an option. Oh god, but no, I mean, not like, Tyson Berry. Guys like Tyson, Tyson Berry and Brodeen, more young, kind of experience, like journeyman experience level of NHL. Like, eh, I eh. Ty- Tyson Berry. A guy like Shattenkirk or Hamannik, I would like, but I mean, what do you got to do to get them? And do you want to? And then we cycle back into the. Eberly conversation. Yeah, and that's the issue. I don't know if the return we get for Eberly by getting rid of him this season will make up for itself next season because I don't think the team wants to fucking suck again next year. Okay, D. White says away we're... Eberly take away too much scoring depth for. I mean, to be fair, we have four fucking first overall. Someone's got to start fucking scoring. But Eberly's the most consistent one out of all of them not named Hall I think that we can rely on to get you know 60 even, 70 even Everly Everly's been more consistent than Hall over his, over his career that's true but he's all less that's, injuries but that's injuries, fair yeah that's fair yeah sorry yeah. James so D White says you wouldn't want Bufflin uh what do you guys think about that idea no um, six million for a guy who people complain has bad foot speed I mean oh boy the worst well okay a better griba but fucking twice as expensive bufflin, i don't know bufflin is looking at six to seven million a year and seven like million. and like yeah oh six to seven and he wants like a six-year deal he's looking six by six a minimum so for his price range it's just it's not it's not worth yeah, we, the we, contract we've been we've been discussing how old is dustin bufflin he's like 29 30, late 20s that era that area i feel yeah. like he's 30 by now um yeah. so f- for that reason i like the game bufflin plays you know he, he's a good offensive defenseman um he, he gets caught a lot in the rush but he also plays with a defenseman who covers him very well in jacob truba um, yeah he's 30, he turns 31 in march so, so this six by like six is his career making contract the the issue the issue for us then is you run into you're giving six million dollars to nuge six million dollars to yak or sorry to hall Six million dollars to Everly, then you have Darnell Nurse who's going to need a contract in two years. You have McDavid who's going to need a contract in two years. You have uh, Drysdale who's going to need a contract in a year, and then you have Sekera who's locked down. Talbot who's going to need one in a few years if we still use him. Uh, Bressois is going to need a new one this year. Davidson's going to need a new one. Uh, we're, we're losing to Keaton and Ference more than likely. Ference this year, along with Bribe and a few others. But at the same time, if you're paying Dustin Bufflin six. I'm gonna guess he's probably gonna get six point three to six point six. So I'm gonna say six years, six point five is what he's gonna get, give or take. Um, I think more than that. So well, I, do, I think it depends on the market too, right? So yeah. 
But for us to afford that contract, we'd have to give up some talent that we can't really lose yeah. or afford to lose. And we My main concern actually isn't so much how it affects our salary cap, but mostly that we'll be bogged down with $10 million in three years in two defensemen who will be getting into their mid-30s and yeah. who may no longer be effective for us. And who the fuck's going to want a 33, 34-year-old Dustin Bufflin at six mil a year? Even if we retain salary, it's just no. Yeah, like that's a lot of money. And if like his foot speed is not great, but if he starts slowing down in his mid-30s, he'll be untradeable. We'll have to just bury him in long-term interest. He, he will slow down. His size. Shit. Yeah. No, his size won't. Like, Sekera's, Sekera's <laughs> foot speed isn't his big thing. I'm not as worried about him burning out, but I think that's a serious, like, red arrow for Buffalo. Yeah. Uh, James? Arunatic says, I say dump Eberle. Am I allowed to say that? He isn't justifiable at $6 million right now, even with McDavid. I think What's he's safe? justifiable at $6 million, but I don't think... I don't... Th- uh, but I don't think you're wrong in saying we could dump him. I think of the three guys making six mil, Everly is the most likely to go, and the one I'd be least hurt with getting rid of because a winger's only ever really going to be good at wing unless he starts learning center when he's young, whereas a center can pretty easily convert to not having to take face-offs or be in the middle all the time. I mean, you could just take dry settle back on the wing, realistically. Also true. Yeah. All nudes dry sidle and then Pouliot, McDavid. Yakupov, Purcell. Even if you trade Yakupov. So do you guys do... Uh, speaking Cassian. Of... Fuck, put Cassian on that second line. Yeah, Two big maybe. banging guys to help get feeded from... He just likes banging dudes. Fed from David. Yeah. Do you guys hear that in the, the game last week? Um, the, the Columbus game. Well, what if, we got rid, what if we got rid of Purcell at the end of this year, and then would you guys be okay with Eberly and Yak going forward? As at right wing, uh, I, th- I think no, because I want Russell back, and I don't really think we should keep Everly and Yak at the amount of money that Yak will need to stay with. I don't, I don't know. I don't. If we can get Purcell back for cheaper than he's currently making, he's decent enough, and he's kind of working on the first line, even if he isn't, you know, first line skill. I, I think, yeah. I, I think with Purcell, you try the old trade him at the deadline for pieces, and then try to acquire him back the rent, yeah. the rent deal. But at the same time, if you trade him, you're not necessarily going to get him back. Yeah, if we trade him to a team easy. and it turns out that team, you know, does well in the playoffs and he really likes the atmosphere there compared to Edmonton. I mean, fuck Edmonton's a team that might suck again next year, even if he does, you know, get along well with the core. Yeah. Um, whereas he, it's like, oh, yeah, Arizona, nice place. No one fucking bothers me in the streets. No one's heckling me on forums. Yeah, fuck it. I'll stay here for three mil a year. Sure. Mm-hmm. And, and then we lose him anyway. And then we traded Yakpov under the presumption that we'd get Purcell back at a discount. And now we only have Everly and Cassian. Now what about talking draft a little bit? Um, we're tied for last with six other teams right now. Um, I guess it depends how today shakes out, but right now we're tied for last with six other six other teams. Say we get a top five. Do you guys trade the top five, or do you pick a, pick someone like Lion A or Pull your RV or you know, someone that's going to bring that punch? Uh... <laughs> I think we were talking about this last last. We episode. were, but we didn't. Uh, we it, didn't really it get. It continues to be much. relevant. It's, yeah, it's very it relevant. Was... It's even more relevant now. Jeez. Actually, let's let's ponder that for a little while. Um, come there back was to a it. comment that was made in the chat. Uh, Liam says, "Cass McDavid Yak equals Semenko Gretzky Curry." <laughs> what do you think? Um, I th- <laughs>